We've all heard that a cult can make a fanatic, but how far would one be willing to go? My name's Adrian, and welcome back to Coffeehouse Crime. Today we're looking at the case of Laurie Vallow and Chad Daybell. This has to be one of the craziest modern day cases out there, involving a religious cult, five deaths, two disappearances, and a lot of questions left unanswered. I hope you're ready for this one, we have so much to look at. So, without further ado, here is the story of Laurie Vallow and Chad Daybell. Our coffeehouse crime case today begins in San Bernardino, California, to Laurie Noreen Cox. Laurie was born on June the 26th, 1973, to her parents, Barry and Janice Cox. She had two older brothers, Alex and Adam, and three sisters, Stacy, Laura and Summer. Laurie's childhood was unremarkable, but considering what's in store in their adulthood, it wouldn't have to be. In 1992, at the age of 19, she married a high school boyfriend, Nelson Yanes. The honeymoon period didn't last long though, and roughly a year later, the two would divorce. Two years later though, she would remarry, to a man named William Lagoya in 1995. Things were going well for them, the two had a child together, a son named Colby Ryan. The couple would make it work for three years, but in 1998, she too would divorce William. Fast forward three more years, and Laurie was getting married for a third time to a man named Joseph Ryan in 2001. On September the 24th, 2002, they would also have a child together, and her name was Tylee Ryan. However, the honeymoon period would not last, and just like clockwork, in 2004 Laurie and Brian would also divorce. Their friendship turned messy afterwards too, because after Laurie told her brother Alex that Ryan had been abusive, Alex would attack Joseph with a taser and threaten him with his life. Consequentially, Alex would be sentenced to 90 days in prison and 5 years in probation for the crime. I wanted to start the story with Laurie's history because it paints a good picture of her personality. Laurie was a very attractive woman throughout the years, and she was charismatic too. But her thirst for adventure and excitement had no limits, and she often grew impatient and frustrated. To top that off with a selfish attitude, it was often her partner that dealt with the brunt of the problem. By the year of 2005, Laurie was single again. She had called it off with her third husband, and although she had two kids, she was only taking full-time care for one of them, Ty Lee. In 2005, she'd meet another man, and this time, more important to the story. His name was Charles Vallow. Charles was a hard-working and discernible man. He was tall, charming, and always dressed well. He came from a big family, one that he cared for a lot. Born on August the 17th, 1956 in Arizona, he met Laurie when he was 49, but by all means, he appeared younger and more energetic. And around the circle we go, because it wasn't long until Laurie found herself marrying Charles on February the 24th, 2006. Charles already had two children from a previous marriage, Nicholas and Zachary. And along with Laurie's daughter Ty Lee and son Colby, the married couple would now have up to four children under their roof. This won't stop here though. The stitched together family were by most standards happy. Charles was a relatively successful businessman, and he kept the family afloat. Laurie though, she wasn't much of a worker. Although she had a job as a hairdresser before marrying Charles, she did not work much after that. The family's arrangements were often weird at times too. During the summer holidays, Nicholas and Zachary would spend time at Charles and Laurie's house. Charles though, who'd be away on business, and Laurie, she would normally be with her family or her friends. This meant that Nicholas and Zachary would often be left alone with Tylee and Colby. By the time 2014 had rolled around, Charles and Laurie had also decided to adopt Charles's grandnephew. His name was Joshua Jackson Vallow, or JJ. And by now, Nicholas, Zachary and Colby were all living elsewhere, meaning that the Vallow family household was now down to four permanent residents. It was no surprise then that in December 2014, Charles and Laurie decided to try something new. So they packed up their bags with JJ and Tylee, and they moved to Hawaii to start up their new business. They opened up a juice bar called Juice Island in Princeville, on Kauai Island. The family seemed to love their time there too, Laurie and Tylee often shared pictures appreciating the island's wildlife and beauty. 
Despite the lifestyle, their business was unfortunately a failure though, and much to the family's dismay, after two years they decided to move back to Arizona in late 2016. And this is where things in the Vallow household would slowly start to go downhill. By the year of 2015, while living on Kauai Island, Laurie had become fascinated by a series of books called Standing in Holy Places. Laurie was by most standards a Mormon, and already quite heavily religious. But these books would take her up a notch, and eventually, they would become critically important to her lifestyle, almost an obsession. The books were created by a religious author named Chad Daybell, and his name wouldn't be one that she would forget about. Since moving home to Arizona in 2016, Laurie grew more attached to her religion and these books, and it wasn't soon after, in autumn 2018, that her friend Melanie Gibb and her attended an event called Preparing a People. It was a religious event, and it was here that the rest of the story became a reality, because this is where she was introduced to Chad Daybell. Ready to Preparing a People Conference announcement with Chad Daybell, one of our main speakers. We are holding the first Rex. According to Melanie, by the end of the weekend, Chad had told Laurie that the two had been married in seven previous lifetimes. This is where the two began messaging each other after the event, and it wouldn't be long until things heated up. It was several weeks later that Charles was out of town on a business trip, and Laurie, she invited Chad round while Charles was out of town. The night wasn't saucy though, Laurie had also invited Melanie and a couple other followers from Chad, and all of them would talk about the deeper mysteries of God. Chad wouldn't keep his eyes off Laurie though, and often throughout the entire night, he made Laurie the centre of attention. Chad Daybell was a strange man. Born on August 11th, 1968, he grew up in Provo, Utah. Chad met Tamara in his teenage years, and by the time he was 22, they had married. He then graduated from his degree in journalism at Brigham Young University two years later, in 1992. Chad didn't have much of a lavish life. He was comfortable, but his first job was at local cemeteries as a gravedigger. That would change though in 2004, when he started his own business. His business, or book company, was called Spring Creek Books. He went on to have five children with Tammy, and published over 25 books, half of them being the ones that Laurie would become obsessed over. He then moved to Rexburg with his family, after claiming that God had told him to do so. Chad would refer to people as light or dark, and everyone was placed in various grades or levels in between. He believed that dark individuals were from this earth, but were followers of Satan, and those who were light were followers of Jesus Christ. Chad told Laurie late that night that he believed she was an eternal being, that she had 21 previous lives, five of which were on planet Earth, the same number he had had. Laurie not only believed Chad on this, but she was thrilled and excited about it too. She was obsessed with this newfound purpose in life, and also obsessed over Chad too. The two kept in regular contact after this, and in October 2018, Chad emailed Laurie to share a chart of light and dark spirit estates, and ultimately, to grade her family and children too. And this takes us to 2019. The Vallow family had been back to living in Arizona for a little over two years by now, and in that time, Charles and Laurie's marriage had started to slowly fall apart. As Laurie invested more and more time into her religion, which at this stage was becoming more of a cult, she became more detached from her everyday life, more aloof, her ideologies more bizarre. She strongly believed in the concept of light and dark people. She referred to those that she thought were dark as zombies. And she also believed that she was an eternal spirit, there to lead the 144,000, a group with a special protection from God. Charles and Laurie began to argue almost every day, and by this stage, their marriage really was on the rocks. On the 31st of January, Charles was on a business trip. It was a Thursday, and he'd been out of town for the week. For the last two days though, Charles hadn't been able to get in contact with his kids. When he arrived back at the airport, he still hadn't heard from Laurie or the kids, and his truck that was in the car park, it was gone. He took a taxi back home, but when he got there, he realised that the locks on his door, they were changed. His clothes were in the bin. $35,000 wiped out of his account. 
This is when Charles would contact the police, and they would meet him at the property. So what's going on tonight? I have the house to say it. We're LDS. She thinks she's a resurrected being and a and a a god and member of the 144,000. She's come. Jesus is coming next year. She took all the money out of her bank account today. My truck has gone from the airport. She went to the airport and got it. I just flew in from Houston, from Dallas. Houston and Dallas. So, uh, so where's your truck? I don't know. Okay. Took a good friend of mine's truck. The cars are all gone. Upon entry of the property, he would realize that the family's cars were gone, and a lot of their assets were gone too. Charles would also open up to police about his wife threatening him, but they wouldn't take him seriously, even once or twice scolding him for wasting their time. It would be this point that Laurie would vanish for 58 days, and in that time, Charles had filed for divorce. Although Charles was clearly worried for her life, he too was just as scared for his and JJ's. She was clearly making advances to jeopardise their safety, and the police were not willing to intervene. Laurie had actually flown back to Hawaii with her daughter Tylee, and while the two would keep their distance when returning in April, this was just the beginning of Laurie's dangerous path. It was now July the 11th, 2019. In the early hours of the morning, a man had called 911 to report that he had killed someone. The caller was Alex Cox, Laurie's brother. 911, where is your emergency? I'm in police in an ambulance. What's the emergency there? Uh, there was a... I got in a fight with my brother-in-law and I shot him in self-defense. And is he hurt or is he alive or...? Yeah, there's blood. He's, he's not moving. How long ago did this happen? Uh, a couple of minutes. What's his name, your brother-in-law? Charles Vallo. Okay, what part of his body is injured? Uh, in the chest. I'm sorry, where? In the chest. Okay, is he awake and responsive or unconscious? Unconscious. Okay, is he breathing? I can't tell. Okay, are you wanting, are you willing to go over to him and check? Sure. Okay. Some officers should be there, let me know when they get in. Police would arrive at the property of 5531 South Four Peaks Place in Arizona just a few minutes later. You know, no Lori had just moved there several days prior. I'm gonna have you have a seat right here on the curb. At the time, she was taking JJ out to school, while Alex and Tylee were in the property. And that is when Charles arrived. According to Alex, Charles approached the property enraged, and while Tylee went to go grab a baseball bat, Charles and Alex got into an argument. Tylee would return with the bat, and Charles would take it out of her hand, before hitting Alex around the head with it. Alex responded by grabbing his gun, before shooting Charles multiple times in the chest. He would die there, in the front room, and police would find him just several minutes later. You would think that the family would be devastated, but no. What was strikingly suspicious, actually, is how Laurie, just outside the crime scene, was behaving. She was recorded making jokes about the situation, and even laughing. How long have you lived here? Like three weeks. Oh, geez. Yeah, okay. That's why the neighbors don't know us. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> like, hi, neighbor, sorry. But what was even strikingly more morbid is what she did a few hours later. She would then host a pool party in her house, just several meters away from where her ex-husband had died literally just hours before. Back at the crime scene, Alex was tending to his injuries while police were questioning him. And although he had claimed that Charles had hit him over the back of his head with the baseball bat, the injury was surprisingly light. This didn't make sense. Charles, he was a semi-pro baseball player. If he had hit Alex in the head with a bat, he would be dead, but Charles was also not a violent person. Police would later release Alex without further questioning, claiming that it was self-defense. The next day, Nicholas and Zachary would learn of their father's death, but it was via text message. Laurie decided not to call. And with big difference to before, the two were beyond devastated. Not surprisingly, Laurie, along with JJ and Tylee, would move out of Arizona shortly after that. And where would they go? Of course, it would be to Rexburg. 
Following the death of Charles, the three began to settle into their new home in Idaho, but the story of Laurie Vallow would only grow worse across the next few months. She enrolled JJ into a nearby school at the beginning of September, but for Tylee, she had not yet done that. It was Sunday the 8th of September 2019 when she took both of her kids, along with brother Alex, to Yellowstone National Park. The family seemed happy in pictures, soaking up a new area in America's summer. But these pictures would be the last time that Ty Lee was ever seen by anyone else again. She just vanished, and Laurie, she surprisingly didn't report this to police either, she just kept quiet. And with Ty Lee moving states just a couple weeks prior, no one really realised that she was missing. JJ started school the following day, and he seemed to be doing well in his new environment, he even made friends in his local neighbourhood. Just two weeks later, on September the 17th, he was seen playing with a friend outside of his new home in Rexburg. A neighbour's doorbell camera captured him running back into his house. But this too would be the last time that JJ was ever seen by anyone else again. And on September the 23rd, Laurie called his school to unenroll him out of the programme. When questioned, she told the headmaster that he was now being homeschooled. And that was it. JJ was gone. Over the course of the next three months, friends and family of Tylee and JJ were slowly but certainly growing concerned over their whereabouts. Family wanted to console the two after the death of their stepfather, but they were never able to get through to them. And Tylee had only kept very brief contact with friends back in Arizona too, all of which were through text, those messages without personality. To anyone that questioned their well-being, Laurie would say that they're doing just fine. She'd either tell them that they were at friend's house or at family's house, but despite all these alibis, no one had seen them for weeks. It was during this time that two things happened. The first one was that Laurie started to rent a storage unit just outside of Rexburg. On October the 1st, 2019, Surveillance footage captured her placing personal belongings such as children's bikes, scooters, and a children's blankets into the unit. The next day, she was seen again. It's not clear who with, but based on the way he walks, it's likely to be Chad Daybell, who of course is a resident of Rexburg, Idaho. Laurie, Alex, and Chad would visit the storage facility a total of nine times in October, and then again in November. The second thing that would happen was a more grisly one. It was October the 9th, and Chad Daybell's wife Tammy was on her driveway taking groceries out of her car. It was at that point that a masked man with a paintball gun walked up to her, and when she turned around to face him, he started firing at her. She screamed for Chad, and as she did, the man ran away. She would then post onto Facebook to say, Something really weird just happened, and I want you to know so you can watch out. I had gotten home and parked in our front driveway. As I was getting stuff out of the back seats, a guy wearing a ski mask was suddenly standing by the back of my car with a paintball gun. He shot at me several times. I have no idea what his motive was, and he never spoke, even after I asked him several times what he thought he was doing. Tammy survived the ordeal, and she was clearly shaken from the attack. Not that this would matter, however, because ten days later, Chad would call 911 to report that Tammy was dead. She had apparently died in her sleep at their home. Detectives would visit the property and rule the death as natural, but when asked if they could perform an autopsy on her, Chad hesitantly declined. This was an odd confrontation to the coroner, but they accepted his rejection without any further questioning. So to recap where we are in the story at this point, we have Laurie Vallow, with a husband and two kids. Her husband is now dead, her two kids now missing. And then we have Chad Daybell, with his wife Tammy. Tammy, now too, is dead. It all seems a little sus, don't you think? All these murders and disappearances. What is going on? What are Laurie and Chad planning? Well, only two weeks later, Chad and Laurie would fly to Hawaii. And there, they would get married. I'm not kidding. It was at this point that all eyes were slowly shifting over to Chad Daybell and now Laurie Daybell. Media, they were realising the strange circumstances to these two families, 
and police, they were silently watching from the distance too. During the honeymoon, and even back at home in Rexburg, Chad and Laurie would start lying to witnesses. Chad would tell people that Laurie never had any children, and Laurie would tell people that Tylee had died years previously. It was at this time, on November the 26th, that police decided to conduct a welfare check on JJ. They went to Laurie's property to ask if they could see him, and Laurie, well, she said that JJ wasn't there. Apparently, he was back in Arizona with her friend Melanie. But it took all of several hours for police in Arizona to cooperate with Idaho PD. And when they confronted Melanie over JJ's whereabouts, she was surprised. She told police that she hadn't seen him for weeks, and also told them that Laurie and Chad had just called her to lie and pretend that JJ was with her. Police at this stage were, quite bluntly, getting pissed off. They went back to Laurie's house the next day with a search warrant, but when they got there, she was gone, and so was Chad. The two had actually taken a flight back to Hawaii, and at this stage, the newly married couple began to remain silent whenever in front of media. And through December 2019 to January 2020, police would officially declare Tylee and JJ as missing. They would raid Chad's house with a search warrant and recover his computers, cell phones, and journals. And they would also provide notice to Laurie to demand that she must produce Tylee and JJ to Rexburg police within five days to avoid being arrested. Laurie's brother Alex would also strangely die on December the 12th, all while this was still going on supposedly to a blood clot, or what some coroners may call as natural causes. The deadline for Laurie's notice arrived and passed, and over that time, she had failed to produce either Tylee or JJ to authorities. She was still also silent on where they were. And that is why on the 20th of February 2020, Laurie was finally arrested by Kauai police on $5 million bail. She was then extradited back to Rexburg and kept in custody. And although they had Laurie behind bars for now, the biggest questions to this case were still left unanswered. Where are Tylee and JJ? Where could they possibly be? And who was responsible for their disappearance? Progress on these questions were unbearably slow for friends and family, and although the smoking gun was firmly placed in Chad's and Laurie's hands, Chad was still a free man, and there still was no evidence. It would be four long, tiring months until June came around. June the 9th. It was 7am when Rexburg police showed up at Chad's front door. They had a search warrant for his property, a remodelled 1960s home built on four acres of land. Investigators were only there for a couple hours before they made a horrific discovery. In the middle of Chad's plot of land near his red barn, unidentified human remains were found. And days later, officials would confirm that those remains were of JJ and Tylee. The question to their disappearance had finally been solved. The rest of Tylee's and JJ's families were distraught. To all of the months that they were missing, they had hopes of a happy ending the discovery of their bodies denying any possibility to the rapidly fading dream. JJ's biological grandparents shared, We are filled with unfathomable sadness that these two bright stars were stolen from us, and only hope that they died without pain or suffering. At around 11am on the day of their discovery, police arrested Chad Daybell as he tried to make a run for it. He wouldn't get far though, as they arrested him only one mile down the road from his property. He was booked into Fremont County Jail on two felony charges, one for concealment, and the other for alteration of evidence. He is yet to face trial. And so the story continues. To the day of this recording, Chad and Laurie are still behind bars. They are yet to face their trials. And although police have shared that they do intend to charge both Chad and Laurie with murder, at the moment, they're both still kept in prison on much lesser charges. Which is quite unbelievable, really. I'm sure Alex Cox would also be in prison right now if he was still alive. 
Police investigations have actually found through GPS triangulation that on the morning after Tylee was last seen at Yellowstone Park, Alex went back to Laurie's house at 2.40am to 3.30am, before heading to Chad Dable's property for two hours at 9am. And GPS coordinates have also indicated that he was again on Chad's property the day after JJ was last seen by any other witness, on September the 23rd. Following Tylee's and JJ's disappearances, several witnesses would also come forward to report that Laurie had started referring to both of them as zombies, those that were dark and followed Satan. So, to me it seems obvious how this will end after trial. Take my own opinion with a pinch of salt, but if I had to guess, Laurie and Chad are to blame. The two seem to be entirely deluded in their religious cult. They found love in each other, and unfortunately, when two monsters meet, terrible things happen. If I had to guess, Laurie ordered her brother to kill Charles after she grew tired of him. Ty Lee was a witness to Charles' death, and so, she had to go. JJ, he wasn't Laurie's biological son either, so she no longer cared. Chad, he killed his wife Tammy when he found an obsessive Laurie. And at this stage, I wouldn't even be surprised to learn that Alex could have been killed by Chad or Laurie, as he was too involved in the previous deaths. Who knows what'll happen next in this case? I for one, can't believe that this is real. It just seems too bizarre. You know, I feel a lot of pain for Tylee and JJ, but I also feel a lot of pain for Charles too. Through watching all the surveillance footage, it's clear to see how much of a good, caring, soft man he was. He had profound love for his family and kids, and he tried to do everything right when Laurie destabilised into becoming a cult fanatic. It's devastating to see police fail him time and time again, and if they'd taken him seriously, there could be four, maybe even five less deaths to this case. Thank you so much for watching another case by Coffeehouse Crime, and for this long one in particular. This story is so big and it has so many layers that I'm sure I've missed some details. But what do you think about Laurie Vallow and Chad Daybell? Do you think that they killed Charles and Tammy? Do you think that they are responsible for the deaths of JJ and Tylee? Do you think there's more to this? Let me know what you think in the comments below, and thank you to Panji Karan and Kimi Archibald for suggesting this case. I'm going to leave it here for today folks, but again thank you for watching, and especially after watching this case, look after each other. Goodbye.